This is the GBU-57 bomb, also known as the Bunker Buster. It doesn't just hit the target, it strikes where the enemy feels the safest. It penetrates layer after layer of the bunker until there's nothing left but rubble. The concept of Bunker Buster bombs originated during World War II when Germany developed a series of heavy armour-piercing bombs to target ships and fortified structures where conventional bombing was ineffective. Later, the Allies joined the race with two British bombs, the 10-ton Grand Slam and the 5-ton Tallboy. These bombs operated on the same principles as modern bunker busters, but their penetration into the ground was limited. This limitation led to significant advancements making today's bunker busters invaluable assets. During the US invasion of Iraq in 1991, intelligence reports revealed a massive number of heavily fortified underground bunkers that needed to be destroyed. Many of these bunkers were buried deep underground or constructed within mountainous terrains, making them unreachable by conventional bombs or delivery systems. These underground fortifications were highly effective, prompting the US government to urgently develop a weapon capable of penetrating deep into the earth to neutralize these bunkers. The need was so pressing that a functional prototype was delivered in just a few weeks. This prototype became the first modern earth-penetrating bomb, the GBU-28 or Blue 113, weighing 2,000 kilograms, measuring 19 feet in length and 36.8 centimeters in diameter. However, the GBU-28 could only penetrate less than 20 feet of reinforced concrete or up to 100 feet of soft soil which made it less effective for targets deeper than 20 feet. The US government quickly realized the need for greater penetration capabilities for bunker busters. There were two main approaches to achieve this, significantly increasing the bomb's weight or reducing its diameter. By 2003, US military researchers had developed the massive GBU-57 bomb, which weighs 14,000 kilograms and can penetrate up to 200 feet of reinforced concrete surpassing the capabilities of all other penetrative munitions. To understand the GBU-57's power, imagine taking the GBU-28, a highly effective bomb for near-surface structures, and amplifying its capabilities tenfold. That's what you get with the GBU-57. How is the GBU-57 made, and what makes it so powerful? The process begins with steel, an exceptionally hard ferritic cobalt alloy, and lots of it. For reference, 80% of the GBU-57's weight is its outer casing, which translates to approximately 11,000 kilograms. The GBU-57 stands about 20 and a half feet tall, roughly the height of a two-story building, with a casing diameter of 31 and a half inches. This immense weight and solid design allow the bomb to withstand the enormous force of impact and penetration upon hitting the ground. Compared to other bunker busters like the 2,000-pound GBU-28 or GBU-31, the GBU-57 is significantly larger. It contains a larger payload of explosives and features a more advanced GPS guidance system for precise targeting. Unlike earlier models, the GBU-57 can operate without a JDAM kit, a device that converts unguided bombs into precision-guided munitions. Its aerodynamic casing allows it to travel faster than the speed of sound when dropped from an appropriate altitude. The bomb is equipped with tail fins for guidance as it lacks a rocket propulsion system. These four fins enable the bomb to glide through the air and hit its target with pinpoint accuracy. Inside its sturdy ferritic cobalt shell lies a 2,300 kilogram warhead comprising 80% TNT mixed with 20% aluminum powder. This mixture is critical, as adding aluminum to TNT increases combustion heat, causing the explosive to burn faster. The result is an explosion that's about 18% stronger than a standard TNT bomb. The warhead is activated by two fuses, one in the nose and another in the tail. The nose fuse, known as the G-force activation fuse, initiates the detonation, while the tail fuse is the primary detonation trigger with a timed delay. These fuses are crucial for ensuring the explosion occurs at the right moment. At the rear of the GBU-57, there is a military-grade GPS system, a set of four-fin gears, a thermal battery pack to power the systems, and a transmitter. 
This GPS system locks onto the target, calculates the trajectory, transmits data to the operator and adjusts the bomb's glide path by controlling its tail fins. Since the bomb has no propulsion, its glide path and impact accuracy depend on the altitude at which it is dropped. Like most bunker busters, the GBU-57 is effective only when dropped from altitudes exceeding 20,000 feet, typically using a B-2 Spirit bomber to achieve the required height. The massive size and weight of the GBU-57 bunker buster bomb are so significant that even the B-2 Spirit bomber can only carry two of these bombs in its payload bay. This makes it the only aircraft capable of completing bombing missions with this type of bomb. Dropped from high altitudes, the GBU-57 has two key advantages. First, it accumulates substantial kinetic energy during its free fall. And second, the Global Positioning System, GPS, has more time to adjust its glide path, making it highly accurate. Once the bomb is released, its kinetic energy increases until it surpasses the speed of sound. Upon hitting the ground, the bomb's immense kinetic energy drives it deep into the surface. Its substantial weight displaces surrounding materials, allowing it to penetrate the ground like a hot knife through butter. When the nose of the GBU-57 contacts the ground, the first fuse is triggered by the sudden change in G-force. By this point, the first fuse has already alerted the microprocessor in the tail section about the penetration and has relayed this information to the second fuse. The second fuse then activates a delay mechanism or reaction switch. Older GBU-57 models use time delay fuses for detonation, but modern dual fuse systems have replaced them. The single fuse designs were prone to missing their target zones by a wide margin during testing leading to the adoption of the dual-fuse system in 2017. However, the GBU-57 still lacks a void-sensing fuse, which means it only detonates when the bomb completely stops moving, sometimes even after passing its intended target zone. When it comes to application and features, the GBU-57 is the largest bunker-penetrating bomb in the world. A single GBU-57 delivers damage equivalent to nearly 10 GBU-28S or BLU-113S in terms of explosive impact and penetration. While the GBU-28 can bury itself about 20 feet into reinforced concrete, the GBU-57 can penetrate up to 200 feet. However, the GBU-57's high cost and the limited number of compatible aircraft present challenges. After all, what good is a bomb if there aren't enough aircraft that can properly carry it? In contrast, the GBU-28 and the GBU-31, another bunker-busting bomb, can be fitted with JDAM kits and are compatible with most fighter jets and bombers. The GBU-57, however, remains exclusively compatible with the B-2 Spirit bomber. The size difference is also noteworthy. Compare the GBU-57 to a human for scale and then do the same with the GBU-31 and GBU-38. The use case for the GBU-57 is vastly different from that of the GBU-28 or the 2,000-pound GBU-31, which are often employed to target high-rise buildings rather than underground bunkers. Interestingly, the GBU-57 is often confused with other heavy bombs, like the GBU-43 Moab, also known as the mother of all bombs. In terms of weight, the GBU-57 leads, weighing over 14,000 kilograms, compared to the GBU-43's 10,000 kilograms. However, the GBU-43 is much larger in dimensions, standing 30 feet tall with a 41-inch diameter. The Moab and the GBU-57 differ significantly in usage. While the GBU-57 is designed for underground bunker destruction, the Moab is used to destroy surface targets. The construction also varies. The GBU-57 has a solid steel casing that makes up 80% of its total weight, while the Moab has a much lighter casing weighing only 1,200 kilograms. Due to its lower cost and easier deployment, the Moab has seen much more frequent use than the GBU-57. The latter's limited use can also be attributed to delays in development programs aimed at making it compatible with more aircraft. Aside from the B-2 bomber, this limitation has contributed to the GBU-57's restricted operational history. 
The actual number of times the GBU-57 has been used remains classified, though test results were disclosed in 2014, 2015 and 2016. In 2017, a redesigned version was tested using the B-2 bomber. Following successful trial drops in 2017, the US Air Force contracted $20.8 million in 2018 to procure an undisclosed number of GBU-57 bombs. One of the first publicized uses of the GBU-57 occurred on October 17, 2024, during an attack on Houthi rebels in Yemen, where it destroyed five underground bunkers. Another factor limiting the GBU-57's use is its cost, over $500 million in research and development with each bomb costing $3.5 million to manufacture. This high cost often outweighs its practical application, which is why smaller alternatives like the GBU-28 and the GBU-31 are widely used in routine military operations. Simply put, no one wants to spend millions to destroy an empty target, and this logic applies here as well. Given the GBU-57's extraordinary capabilities, it is reserved for only the most critical missions. The US defense strategy relies on the limited use of this massive bomb, reserving it for the most extreme situations. It's fascinating to have a weapon so powerful that even its owner hesitates before deploying it. However, it seems the United States truly enjoys having the GBU-57 in its arsenal, at least until they develop something even better. Goodbye for now and don't forget to follow until end with daily news.